Hello class, this is not a Unit 5 and Unit 6 test review, so to speak. It's merely to help guide and facilitate your studies. Okay, so we talked about the origins of the Enlightenment at length in this class. Uh, there's going to be a video description about the origins of the Enlightenment to help you remember this. Um, but we're especially interested in the link between the uh, Enlightenment and the Age of Revolutions. Um, so how does the Enlightenment ideas such as the social contract theory, which I'm going to talk about at length right now, contribute to the Age of Revolutions. Um, so by the Age of Revolutions, I mean uh, the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Haitian Revolution, the Latin American Revolutions, etc., um, which you're going to have to go back and know. So Thomas Hobbes comes up with this idea of the social contract uh, to explain where legitimacy comes from. So he's, Thomas Hobbes is trying to explain uh, what gives governments the right to rule over us. And so in medieval Europe, uh, this was answered by the divine right of kings, this idea that the kings were given the divine right to rule over us. Uh, you see this idea of divine right, uh, not just in European societies, but also in other societies as well. Um, but the Enlightenment um, allowed Thomas Hobbes the environment to come up with an alternative theory of the origins of governmental legitimacy, which I'm going to talk about now. So although the social contract theory propagated by Thomas Hobbes was not the most extreme variant, um, you know, the most extremes come in the form of Montesquieu and, and Locke, it still contributes to um, destabilizing governments throughout Europe and eventually the world. Um, so the, the social contract theory uh, claims that before there was government, there was anarchy. Uh, and that in this anarchy, which Thomas Hobbes called the state of nature, life was nasty, brutish, and short. There was no government to enforce laws. Uh, if I wanted something, I could just go ahead and, and kill someone to get it. Uh, it was complete chaos. Um, although this, the researchers, sociologists, political scientists have largely agreed that the state of nature never actually existed, again, we're not interested in Thomas Hobbes' theory of the social contract because of its truthfulness at explaining historical events in world history, but we're more interested in it because of its impact on world history. It eventually leads uh, to the age of revolutions, and I'll explain the link just shortly. So the social contract theory, in short, is that from this state of nature, I, as a human being, although I could get whatever I wanted by murdering somebody, would still fear other people murdering me, so I would decide to come up with a social contract. So a bunch of people and I would get together, we would elect a sovereign or a ruler uh, that would uh, rule over us, we would all issue a social contract. So we would give power to the government, and in turn, the government would uh, be forced to protect our rights. This has significance because um, it implies something else. It implies that the government, or the king, did not get his power from the divine right, from God, uh, but instead got it from the people a long time ago. Um, so this would imply that if the government ever misused his power, or abuse their power, I have the right to replace or overthrow it. With that right to replace or overthrow government uh, gets at this idea or, or this, this link between the Enlightenment and the Age of Revolutions. This is the link. Government suddenly looks less fallible. If the king uh, did not get his right to rule from, uh, from divine right, and instead got it from a social contract that originated uh, many years earlier, uh, people have the right to replace or overthrow it. You can see, at least somewhat, this relationship between the divine right, I'm sorry, between social contract theory and governments. Social contract theory has an impact on the development of governments for years. Uh, the Constitution the United States Constitution is an aim to create a social contract. Um, so you can see the significance 
of Thomas Hobbes' theory about the origin of political legitimacy. Um, so, Enlightenment ideas help kickstart uh, revolutions. You're going to have to know the difference between the American and French Revolution, uh, what exactly kickstarts them, the Haitian Revolution, and then Latin American revolutions, all of which you can find in your Princeton Review Guide. So I think you all have a general sense of the American Revolution, so I would go back and study the French Revolution. I would know the three estates. What are they? The significance of them? What's the National Assembly? Um, who is Maximilien Robespierre, what's the reign of terror, etc., what's the Committee of Public Safety. I would also know and be able to contrast the American and French revolutions, which I think your Princeton Review Guide does for you. Uh, on page 231, it says, uh, the American Revolution involved a colonial uprising against the imperial powers. In other words, it was an independence movement. The French Re Revolution involved citizens rising up against their own country's leadership and against their own political and economic system, and in that sense was more of a revolution. Um, so I would know that. I would also note that to a significant extent, the French Revolution was less successful than the American Revolution. It descends into the reign of terror, um, you know, uh, with Maximilien Robespierre executing people by the guillotine, and he eventually gets executed himself. It also uh, ends um, with the rise of Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, the French revolutionary ide ideals um, get thrown away. Uh, Bonaparte um, becomes a, the effective dictator of France. I would also note um, the linkages between the American and French Revolution. Uh, the French Revolution was uh, started um, in no small part due to economic woes, um, thanks to French adventurism overseas. The French were actually helped fund uh, American revolutionaries. And so knowing that link between the American and French revolutions is important as well. Um, finally, uh, with Napoleon Bonaparte, it's really important that you understand that his campaigns in Europe have a relationship and a link between Latin American uh, revolutions um, that you will need to know as well. So I would know a lot about the campaigns of Napoleon Bonaparte, which is discussed at length at page 232 to 233 in your Princeton Review Guides. Um, uh, chapter 8 of your Princeton Review Guides, I would know about the um, campaigns. I would also know that Napoleon is eventually defeated, and in 1815 the Congress of Vienna uh, declared that a balance of power should be maintained among the existing powers of Europe in order to avoid the rise of another Napoleon. I would also note that effectively they uh, reinstall monarchs, right? It's, it's a pushback. The Congress of, Vien of Vienna is a pushback against uh, Enlightenment revolutions and Enlightenment ideals, uh, destabilizing monarchies. Um, so it's a reset almost. I would know that. Um, and then I would finally know um, how Napoleon's campaigns, particularly his invasion of Spain, uh, relates to and has significant impact on Latin American revolutions. Um, Latin American revolutions in, um, you know, Venezuela, for example, or in Haiti. Uh, South American revolutions as well. Um, and I would go back and read those pages um, from page 234 to 235. There are several things you have to know about the Industrial Revolution, uh, but one of the most important is its linkage and relationship between um, the linkage and relationship between industrialization and new imperialism. Uh, countries that industrialize first become early imperializers, and then later countries that successfully industrialize also become imperializers. China, for in instance, does not successfully industrialize. Uh, Japan, however, does, and also becomes an imperialist power in its own right. Uh, so I would know this relationship. I would know these linkages as well between industrialization and imperialism. Um, and they start on page, let me check, of your Princeton Review Guide, 238. Obviously, there's a lot that you need to know about the Industrial Revolution, such as, you know, poor working conditions and the benefits of the Industrial Revolution, mass production, the factory system, etc., but, and uh, specific technological innovations, but you also need to know about new economic and social philosophies, such as Marxism and laissez-faire capitalism, I included videos in the description that help unpack uh, 
Mark, Karl Marx's uh, thinking and also unpacked Adam Smith's contributions uh, to economic and political philosophy as well. So I'll go ahead and view those and know them. Um, you also have to know motives for imperialism. Uh, the three G's apply in both old and new imperialism, God, gold, and glory. Um, so economic mod motives would be gold, uh, the search for market and resources, um, you know, is, is great after the Industrial Revolution. In old imperialism, the desire to convert natives of the New World. In new imperialism, desire to civilize um, Africans and Southeast Asians. Um, so this this uh, is uh, linked to the white man's burden or the la mission civilistrice, the civilizing mission. Social imper imperialism is all about exporting your problems. We talked about penal colonies like Australia. Uh, social Darwinism. Uh, as well. Go back and read that and uh, check out my mixtape uh, hashtag motives for imperialism dbq that I created uh, for you. Uh, link in the description. Um, so you also have to know what European imperialism actually looked like and the different forms it actually took. European imperialism was more economic imperialism. What does that mean economic imperialism in China for instance? Um, American imperialism, um, you also have to know what American imperialism looked like, was also more economic in Latin America, um, for instance. But European imperialism in China um, was, and it, to an extent, it, it, I kind of misnamed the slide because it was also Japanese imperialism and American imperialism in China, was the carving up of spheres of influence in China. Um, the carving up of spheres and influence um, because of want of access to Chinese markets. And you can see that uh, depicted in the political cartoon. Uh, you have to be able to compare imperialism in India, for example, and imperialism in, um, let's see, maybe Japan, or the effects of it, imperialism in Africa. What was the Berlin Conference? The Berlin Conference being the actual conference where European powers decided to divide up the continent of Africa. What is the scramble for Africa, etc.? All of that is discussed at length at your Prince Review Guide. You need to read it. What was life like under imperialism? It sucked. No one liked it. I mean, yeah, there were certain benefits, uh, and we, it's discussed at length in your Prince Review Guide, um, such as, you know, the building of infrastructure on the African continent, etc. But also, it came with, you know, the destruction of cultures the destruction of peoples, the killing and starving of peoples, the overworking of individuals, the basic enslavement, not exactly the actual enslavement of, of uh, Africans, for instance. You have to know what these three terms mean. Um, empire, for instance, it refers to political control by a dominant state of the domestic and foreign policy of weaker states. Empire is very important, and understanding uh, its definition is very important. Um, also understanding that the word empire, especially for people that live in a republic like the United States, it is often used as a pejorative, meaning it's often used as a negative term. But empire describes a certain type of political relationship. Um, and so we talk about, talked about the British Empire, the French Empire, etc. Um, ideology. Ideology is an action-oriented system of beliefs. We talked about the impact of ideologies like Marxism, and we're going to learn a lot about the impact of ideologies like Marxism and capitalism, especially when we get to the Cold War. These are enduring concepts. I should have put enduring concepts instead of themes, but I'm not going to change it because I'm tired, uh, that you just need to know, especially empire. I'm going to, I think I talked about this project that I started um, where we're going to read this essay called The American Empire that was written right before um, the start of the um, Second Iraq War. Um, and empire is, of course, used more in a metaphorical sense, uh, but it has significance. Uh, you know, understanding the definition of the term uh, has bearing on your ability to understand the argument and the various concepts presented in that essay which I'm going to be breaking down as the semester goes along, and it's a long project that I'm undertaking. Um, I put as a subpoint nationalism. A nationalism is an imagined community with certain raw materials such as language, traditions, and myths. 
we're going to talk a lot about nationalism and keep talking about nationalism. Uh, and we've talked about nationalism to, in its significance to this day. Uh, but we're going to talk about nationalism when we get to World War I, or we talk about World War II, where we see aggressive nationalism uh, in the form of German nationalism. And I put nationalism as a sub-bullet point under ideology because nationalism is an example of an ideology. There are other examples of ideologies, such as uh, Marxism, etc. Um, but it is action, ideologies are action-oriented in that they try to spur you to act, they try to encourage you to act, and they're a system of beliefs, right? They can get you to do really dumb stuff, uh, but not necessarily. Um, why is nationalism an imagined community? It's an imagined community because there's no way that you would know every single person that is a part of a nation, but yet you feel some sense of attachment to that person. So as an American, I feel some sense of attachment to other Americans that are killed overseas, even though I will never know that person. So it's an imagined community. What are some of your next steps? These are your next steps. You read chapter 8 of the Princeton Review and answer the chapter questions at the end, or be able to answer the chapter questions at the end. You don't have to answer them. Also, make sure you know each of the key terms of the Princeton Review Guide of chapter 8. Read the article from, from the Financial Times that I've provided on Google Classroom, and I'm going to provide a link in the description because it's going to help you for one of the SAQs. Don't complain that you don't know the answer to the SAQ on test it. Read the two sections from chapter six of the AMSCO textbook about uh, demographic trends um, during the era from 1750 to 1900, um, because you're gonna need to know those for another SAQ question. Know how to write an SAQ, we've discussed this, use ACE. Uh, study um, your review guide notes, etc., and look at the links in the description. I included a lot of helpful links. By no means you have to click all of them, you don't have to rewatch all the Open Yale course lectures, but they're there for you. I would look at the other descriptions like the Khan Academy video, uh, the School of Life videos that help break down Adam Smith's philosophy, etc., because they're going to help you. And also call me, text me, beep me, whatever that Kim Possible song is, if you want to reach me, because I want you to succeed on this test. Good luck.